Let's pray. Our Father, thank you so much for days like this. Thank you for the communion. Lord, I'm so thankful this is something that you desire to do with us. Your word says with fervent desire, I have desired to have this meal with you, Lord. And so we're just thankful for this fellowship and this time with you. Um, Lord, I'm thankful for your blood that you shed on the cross. Lord, thank you for your grace and mercy. And may, may the words spoken here today be your words. Lord, just, just spill the Holy Spirit on the church. We love you so much in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Um, we're going to start in John 6. Chapter uh, John 6, verse 53. Lord, help me. Is this right? All right. Pastor Jason's watching online. Watch this. <laughs> Hallelujah. Um, verse 53. Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. And I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers ate the manna and are dead. He who eats this bread will live forever. These things he said in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Um, and this is Jesus talking about what we just did, communion. Um, and, and there's a lot more to, there's a lot more into that, but but he was talking about his body and he was talking about the blood and the sacrifice, and, and the disciples said, This is a hard thing to understand, or who can understand it? And Jesus asked them, he said, Does this offend you? Does this offend you? Are y'all offended by this? And so Jesus goes on to say, Therefore I have said to you that no one can come to me unless that has been granted to him by my Father. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. Um, from the very get-go, the blood of Jesus, the, the, even speaking about the blood of Jesus has offended people. And... Um, some disciples turned and left him. And not only did Jesus not go after him, the very next verse, he said to the 12, would y'all like to go with them? Um, today we're going to talk about the blood of Jesus and um, how if you do not partake of it, you have no life in you. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians 6 to begin. said after first service, I was going to mark them all in my Bible. All right. I'm going to start at verse 9, or 19, I'm sorry. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? Who is in you, whom you have, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So Paul's talking to the Corinthians about defiling their bodies and how their body is the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. And, and, but he said something in that verse that jumps off the page. It's super profound. He said, you were bought at a price. Do you know who you belong to today? Do you know, who, do you know whose you are? Jesus bought you at a price. You were bought and paid for by the blood of Jesus. And, and if, if you, if you want to walk in that and have peace, you can. If you don't want to walk in that and be tormented, he'll let you do that too. He, he's a, Jesus is a gentleman. He'll let you make the decision. And he'll respect your decision. But make no mistake, you belong to him. You're bought and paid for. And we talk a lot about what Jesus did for us. 
the life of Jesus. Last week we celebrated his birthday, um, or the birth of Jesus. We don't know his birthday. But he spent, th if God wanted us to know his birthday, he had to put it in the Bible. So he spent 33 years on earth. He was baptized around the age of 30, spent about three years in ministry, uh, walking with his 12 disciples. Then he had this meal um, that we call the Last Supper during the Passover. And this set the tone and the stage for what we call communion today, what we just did. It's the breaking of the bread represents the broken body, uh, the drinking of the fruit of the vine or the wine that represents his blood shed on the cross. So he died on the cross. He shed his blood, and three days later, God raised him from the dead. So this morning, I want to talk about a little bit about what the blood of Jesus does for us as Christians. And I don't, I don't like this term very much, but, but it's the only one I, I know or that I can come up with is I'm going to do the best I can to keep the cookies on the bottom shelf. Or keep it simple, as they say. Um, and the blood of Jesus is, man... You could, a lifetime in studies on the blood of Jesus and go down rabbit hole after rabbit hole after rabbit hole. And I, yesterday morning, I got up around 4 o'clock and began to study on just the blood of Jesus. And yesterday at 5.30 p.m., I'm still reading and studying on the blood of Jesus without a break. It's that intense. There's so much meat on the bone. I'm going to try to keep it simple. And... and so the first time blood is mentioned in the Bible was Cain and Abel. Um, God said, the blood of your brother cries out to me. So there the blood represents death, but still cries out to the Father. So, I mean, I could preach on that all day, but today we're going to keep it simple. I believe the Lord has a, sim the Lord has a simple word for you all this morning. I'm going to try to get you all out of here before the Baptists get to Dairy Queen. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Uh, are we Baptists? So what, so what exactly does the blood of Jesus do for us? This morning we're going to take, talk about a few uses of the blood of Jesus. And some of them will overlap. Um, so bear with me. But you need to know why the shedding of blood was necessary. Um, if you don't know the story about the Passover... Everybody knows Moses went to free the Israel, or went to try to free the Israelites, and, and the Pharaoh kept saying no. And Moses said, "Let my people go." And Moses and and Moses, Pharaoh said, "I'm not going to do it." And and there was these these plagues and plague after plague after plague after plague. Um, and it gets to the last plague, and it's the death of the firstborn. And so the angel of death is coming to kill all the firstborn. And the Israelites were to go slaughter a sheep or a goat. They got to choose and and. Um, there was some ceremonial stuff, okay? But basically, they they put it in a bucket, took a hyssop, and they they would mark it on their 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 door frames or the lintels. And and when the angel saw the blood of the lamb, it passed over their home. They were saved from death. So um, that's where the Passover comes from. The word Passover comes from the angel of death passed over their homes, and then eventually it all comes down to communion. Um, and I just want to talk about how that parallels in our life. So the blood of Jesus, what does it do for us? Let's turn to the book of Matthew chapter 26. Wow. Um, I'm going to go to verse 26. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it. And gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them saying, drink from it, all of you. For this is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my father's kingdom. <clears throat> and when they had sung a hymn, they went up to the Mount of Olives. So... Jesus said, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. And the book of Hebrews says, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. So remission is defined as a cancellation of a debt or a charge, a cancellation of a penalty. Uh, the, the, the blood of Jesus cancels your debt of eternal damnation. So if the wages of sin is death, 
right? And, and the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. The penalty or the charge for sin is death. But because of the bloodshed of Jesus, you've been excused from that death. First John chapter 1. Lord help me. You ever get to an age where you need to get a new Bible that has bigger words in it? <laughs> Lord, just let no, I'm not putting them on, buddy. <laughs> I'm stubborn. I saw a sign. I got a picture of it. It says it was on the uh, on the highway, and it said, um, "A certain percent of men will die this year from stubbornness." And somebody painted on there, "No, we won't." First <laughs> um, John one. Um, let's read. Uh, I'll go from six. If we say that we have fellowship with him. And, do, and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Cleanses us from all sin. All sin. Past, present, and future. If, 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 he, if, if the cross did not cleanse us from our future sins, then it was a massive failure. The cross cleanses you from all sins, past, present, and he, I don't want to get into old Levitical law, but they would have to go in and, and once a year for the day of atonement, and, and, and man, when Jesus died, all our sins were future sins. Once you're born again, you are no longer a sinner. The Bible never once calls a born-again Christian a sinner, not one time. You are saints, you are royalty, you are kings, you are priests. Romans 5, 9. Romans 5, 9, please. Lord, help me. <clears throat> That's what the Lord says. Slow down a bit. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Saved from wrath through him, capital H. So we have been justified by his blood. God has an angry side. Um, when, when Jesus died on the cross, God poured out his wrath onto his only son. The wrath that was meant for us, the wrath that we truly deserve, God poured out his wrath on his only son. And by that, we, we are justified by his blood. Justified, the definition, an act by which God moves a willing person from the state of sin to the state of grace. Uh, someone said this to me one time. If you're confused by the word justified in the Bible, say it like this. Just as if I'd never sinned. Justified. Just as if I'd never sinned. And you walk into a courtroom, if you are justified, you are found not guilty. Because Jesus took all the punishment. And you can't be punished twice for the same cri crime, not in the kingdom, right? So none of that punishment can be accounted to you anymore. You stand before God justified and righteous. You become a new creation. The blood of Jesus speaks on your behalf and completely cleanses you. So you're now covered. If you're born again, see, listen, if you're not born again, the blood of Jesus doesn't apply to you. And if you're not born again and you don't know who Jesus is and you haven't been water back, listen, don't go into 2024. Don't leave this room today without being covered by the blood of Jesus. Uh, Revelation 12, 11. Or 1210. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God is. Ooh, hold on, I'm going to go back to seven. And war broke out in heaven. 
Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. He was cast out to the earth and his angels were cast out with him. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives to the death. Hallelujah. Overcome the devil by the blood of the lamb. And the word of their testimony. Who's got a testimony? If you're born again, you have a testimony. Your testimony is powerful. You use your testimony to defeat the devil. The Bible in Colossians says that he disarms principalities and powers. He made a public spectacle of them. So now you overcome the devil by the word of your testimony, even if you don't know the Bible very well. You don't have to know the Bible very well to tell people what Jesus has done in your life. I, I said this in first service. Why isn't there a book just called Jesus? The book of Jesus, and it's just a story about the life of Jesus. Because the devil is overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of your testimony. So there's the book of Matthew. Matthew, just a dude who hung out with Jesus. So he wrote down what Jesus did in his life, what he saw Jesus do. That became his story, right? It became one of the gospels, the gospel according to Matthew. And then there's, there's Mark and Luke and John, the, the disciple whom Jesus loved. They all wrote their own story with their own eyes, what Jesus had done for them. Church, I'm telling you, get out there and tell your so story to somebody. Somebody next to you needs to hear it. What about the gospel according to you? What did Jesus do in your life? <clears throat> Revelation 1 5. And if you don't know the Bible and you don't own a Bible, there's a free Bible. Free Bibles on every windowsill in this church. So grab one on your way out. Um, Revelation 1. We'll start in verse 4. Man. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia... Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are, are before his throne and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler over the kings of the earth to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests to his God and father to him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. The blood washes you clean and makes you royalty. Why is that even important? Why do we need to know that? Back in, in biblical, maybe even today, I don't know. I've never been to a king's room except for our, our king's throne. I've never been to a king's room. But I know in, in, in the biblical times, if you walked into the, the throne room without... Um, Authority, they would kill you. If you walked in without permission or purpose or dominion, it happened to um, one example I brought up this morning. Esther, she walked into the throne room and the, and the king pointed a scepter at her. Had he not done that, they would have killed her. So why is it important that Jesus, by his blood, declares us kings and priests? Um, i got to run back to the Old Testament for just a second, so stay with me. The, there's Adam and Eve, and they sin. That they're, they're walking around in their, in their sinful nakedness, and animals were killed to provide cover for them as guilty sinners. That principle, it, that's where that was established. Um, and so then the, 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 the killing of an animal, right, the shedding of blood. And then Levitical law... It gives details of the high priest 
and the annual day of atonement that I mentioned a few minutes ago. Huge day of the year. For everybody. It's, it's like all your sins for the year are being forgiven by the sacrifice of these animals. But the, the, the high priest was the pivotal role in this, the high priest. And um, he goes into the, the holy of holies. It's like the back of the back of the back, right? Behind the curtain. And no one's allowed back there. And if you walk into the Holy of Holies, you'll die. It's where the Ark of the Covenant is in the, in the Shekinah glory of the Lord. And he would go in there and make... It was such a beating. I mean, I've never done it, but I've read about it. And it's hard to even read. They're burning things outside the tent, bringing it in and waving incense so they can't see the Shekinah glory because that'll kill you, right? And, and then they're, they're killing things and blood and, 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 and with the hyssop and, and just sprinkling it with blood and cleansing it. Listen, it was hard to get rid of sin, all right? So... But anyways, they would, after that, they would sprinkle the blood on some other things. And, and the theme throughout the Bible is that sin is very, very costly. And the mark of the blood of the Lamb cleanses us, covers us, covers our sin, so that we can now enter the holy of holies, into the throne room of God with boldness. We are covered by the blood. When God sees you, he doesn't see your sin. He sees his son's perfection in you. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father except through me. So this means we can go into the throne room of the Almighty God because of the blood of Jesus. Are you confident in what the blood of Jesus has done for you? I, I asked this first service. I asked somebody recently, but do you... When you walk into a room, do people know who you belong to? Can other people see it on you? I, I asked that to somebody the other day, and they were very, I said, when you walk into a room, do people know that you're a Christian or that you belong to Jesus? And their answer was probably not. Or what does that look like? Or why, you know, and they're very confused. And so I asked them this. I said, when I walk into a room, do you think people know that I belong to Christ? And her response was this. Yes, but doesn't that mean you're arrogant? <clears throat> Church, if you know who you belong to, it is not arrogance. If you've been saved by grace through faith and sealed by the Holy Spirit, which is the same power that raised Jesus from the dead, it is not arrogance. God forbid I boast, but if I boast, I boast in the Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me. I belong to Jesus Christ, a faithful witness, the first from, born from the dead and the ruler of... Listen, I'm walking around with the mark of the blood of the Lamb. It is not arrogance. I could preach and preach and preach and talk and talk and talk, but the kingdom of God is not in word. It's in power, and I will walk around with the power and the authority of the Holy Ghost by the power of the blood of Jesus. It is not arrogance. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Church, you're the light of the world. Christians, you are the light of the world. Not by anything you've done, but for what Jesus did for you on the cross. Amen. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Let your light shine before men so that they will see your good deeds and glorify Father. It's not arrogance if you know who you belong to. You were bought and paid for uh, with a price, and that price was the blood of Jesus. Let me tell you something. Let's get our money's worth, church. Hallelujah. There ain't nothing wrong with walking in the power and authority of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And don't you ever let the devil tell you different. You were anointed. You were chosen. Hallelujah. <laughs> Man, I almost started crying just now. Oh, Hebrews 9. We're going to go chapter, man. Chapter 9, verse 13. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the puring of the flesh, 
how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Clear your conscience? When I was, when I was younger, I, I got in big trouble. Big trouble one time. I did something really stupid. And one, my sister said, aha, one time. Anyway, um, I will never forget, get caught. My dad comes to pick me up. And he doesn't say a word. He, and that's not like my dad. He's got a lot to say. Punishment. Uh, man, you know how many times I got tore up. And I'm, that's a different sermon, but I'll tell you this. This Bible says, whoop your kids. Sorry to all the kids in here, but it's true. Um, my dad picked me up and didn't say a word. And it did something to me. He didn't even, he didn't even punish me. He just brought me home. He didn't say anything. Um, and that lasted with me for a long, long time. Stuck with me. And um, about, I don't know, 15, 20 years later, and I was sitting with him somewhere. We were eating. And I said, Dad, something's been weighing on me for a long time. And I, I just started confessing it to him and telling him what happened and saying thank you for how you handled it and whatever. And he literally, without missing a step, took a bite of his food and goes, I don't have any idea what you're talking about. <laughs> I don't know if he chose to let it go. I don't know if he moved on, I forgot because he got old. But let me tell you something. God chooses to remember your sin no more. If he'll let it go, maybe you should let it go. Amen. He, he wants you to have a clear conscience. The blood of Jesus gives you let it go. Don't carry it another day. And I don't know if you dropped a rock in the bucket or what. If you didn't let it go, let it go. And I, I whoo wee. Um, man, there's a reason I don't wear a hat when I preach. Because the Bible says he who covers his head when he prophesies shames his own head. And I don't, I don't know that I'm going to prophesy, but the Bible says pray for prophecy. Um, and I do often, and um, I don't know if this is you, but um, the Lord has put it on my heart to say this. There's something that you're doing, and you can't stop doing it, and you're doing it over and over and over to the point where you're ashamed. You're ashamed to go speak to your heavenly father about it. It's like, um, well, here I am again. I messed it up again. Oh, boy. Here's a word for you. God says, your sins are forgiven. Let it go. Don't leave this room with it. Let it go. Let it go. If you're a Christian or if you're a non-believer, the difference is this. As a Christian, it hurts when I sin. I have a, a Holy Spirit compass inside of me, and it's painful. It does something. The Holy Spirit convicts. There's a, this battle inside of us, the war against flesh and blood, uh, the spirit and the flesh. And the spirit will convict you when you, your flesh wants to be made happy. The spirit will convict you to be joyful. And there's a difference. And when our flesh wins, we feel bad for letting down Jesus. Church, clear your conscience and let it go. Jesus cleared it up 2,000 years ago. Let it go today. Don't carry it into tomorrow. Uh, 1 Peter 1.18. <clears throat> Here we go. 
I'm going to start at 17. And if you call on the Father, who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. You were redeemed by the blood of Jesus. Knowing that you're not redeemed by corruptible things. Silver and gold, pretty nice, but they're corruptible. The blood of Jesus cannot be corrupted. And listen, the writer's point here is that the cross cannot be taken away from you. I don't care what you've been taught. I don't care what people, this Bible says, once you are born again and it's no longer you who lives, but Christ that liveth in you and you've been sealed by the Holy Spirit, that cannot be stolen away from you, it cannot be taken away from you, and it cannot be returned to him. If you are born again and you are saved, that is with you. Jesus said, I give them eternal life and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. When you belong to Jesus, you belong to Jesus, and they can't take it away. Hey, Ben, you want to come up? <clears throat> the blood of Jesus gives you a purpose. And I don't know if you know or not what your purpose is, but you have a purpose in Christ Jesus. You have a calling. You have an anointing. In this world, the devil... In this world will tell you to wake up every morning in pursuit of happiness and I and I'm not I'm not talking about joy joy is a fruit of the spirit joy is a state of mind I can be angry and still have joy I'm talking about happiness it's a fleshy instant gratification feeling in this rotten world that we get into every day will tell you to pursue your happiness and there's not any in it very little it's a trick from the devil. I'm, you, how many times you heard this? You go out there and you find what makes you happy. And you just do that. How many, how many people succeeded in that really? You just go out there and find what makes you happy. And, and Look, that's straight from the pits of hell. That's demonic. Because the world is not a happy place. It's a hard place and it's tough and it's difficult. And if you'll spend your days looking for happiness, you're not going to find any. And we'll search and search and search and search for happiness. Then when we get let down and let down and let down, only one thing left to do. Go sit at home and complain. Go sit at home and complain about how horrible my life is. Life is so bad. It's so horrible. How It's unfair. It's unfair, and I'm offended that I can't be made happy every day. It, you know what the Bible says about the world? The world hates you. Do not love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in them. The whole world lies in the sway of the wicked one. You think he can't sway you into believing you're happy every now and then, toss you a little instant gratification, happiness sometimes? Romans 12 says, do not, do not be conformed to the ways of this world. James says that friendship with the world is enmity with God. You want to be friends with the world, you'll be an enemy of God the Father. If you continue to be let down by the world, here's the sad part. You're seeking this thing called happiness and then you never find it. We just complain and whine and we get tormented, we're offended, and then what? We become a victim. We're just a victim. That's the greatest trick of the devil, or one of them, is making you believe that you're a victim. Instead of finding joy by the way of the Spirit, the devil has invited you to seek something you'll never truly find in the world. And we've taken it. We've taken the bait, hook, line, and sinker. Think we'll find... Nothing ever really goes right. This is, life is so unfair. We're so unhappy all the time. We're so jealous of... This person next door, and they're jealous of the per person sitting next to us because they've got it all figured out. And guess what? They ain't got it figured out either. They lying on Facebook too. <laughs> <You're, Amen>. this, <laughs> this victim mentality is the most dangerous mentality. 
And I could go through a list of reasons why, right now why no one in this room is a victim. If, if you eat, if you've got a meal to eat, you're not a victim. I, and if you don't, there's a thousand people in this room that'll buy you lunch. Amen. This is a cowboy church. We take care of each other here. Amen. If you're breathing right now, you're not a victim. You got a little gas in the car at home. A good friend you can count on. Some family that you love, you're not a victim. The number one reason you're not a victim is that you are a child of the Most High God and you are covered from the wrath of God by the blood of Jesus. You are not a victim in this room here today. And the people living this victim mentality, ooh, I love me some Jordan Peterson. The people living this victim mentality, you know what Jordan Peterson, call, Peterson calls them? Weak losers. It's, he says this in the context of he wishes someone would have sat him down when he was a kid and said, it's not okay to be a weak loser. It's not okay to play the victim. And the reason it's not okay is because you could be way more than that. And you know it. It's a crime to let it all go to waste. And you know you could be more than you are today. You know that the inside of you is locked up so much potential and the world's a bad place, but you're tough. By the power of the blood of Jesus who has already overcome the world, you're tougher than this world. There is a spirit inside of you if you're born again that already won the war. <clears throat> My goodness. Listen, church, we're bringing an army of weak losers seeking happiness in the world instead of an army of soldiers in pursuit of the purpose of the kingdom of God. Teach them that. What's your purpose? The blood of Jesus gives you purpose. Do you have a testimony? What Jesus has done in your life? What has the blood of Jesus truly done for you? There's a neighbor that needs to know. There's a friend that needs to hear it. That, that thing you did a long time ago, there's somebody next to you that needs to hear how Jesus drug you out of that. Doesn't matter how embarrassing it is. The word of our testimony. Have you even believed that the blood of Jesus does anything for you? Have you believed that Jesus shed his blood on the cross and three days later God raised him from the dead? Hallelujah. If, if you're not, there's no life in you. You know, the true representation of the blood of, of Christ is life. <laughs> the, the mark of the blood of the Lamb represents a victory over death. <clears throat> Hallelujah. And let me tell you something. If that's you, if, if, if you're not born again, you don't know what that, even what that means. Don't leave here today. Ministers, would you come up, please? Elders, would you come up, please? We're going to do something. And I want you to truly, in your heart, answer these questions. Have you confessed Jesus Christ as your Lord? As the Lord of your life? As you, have you confessed him as the Lord of your life? Have you believed in your heart that God truly raised him from the dead? Have you given yourself over to Christ? He bought and paid for you 2,000 years ago. Have you been saved? Have you been baptized? Please don't leave here and enter out into the world seeking happiness in 2024. Don't leave this room without Jesus. And may... Maybe you are born again. Here's a kingdom dynamic. Are any among you sick? And that doesn't mean healing sick, physically sick. Physically, mentally. Do you need emotional healing? Mental healing? Spiritual? If you're not born again, you are spiritually sick. And the Bible says if any of you are sick, call on the elders of the church. Well, we're going to make it real easy. They're just going to be standing up here. You have to take a step. The Bible, the Bible says call on them. That's an action word. You have to take action. And then guess what? 
Hmm. Jesus will grab your hand and walk you up here. You want a fresh start? Maybe there's some junk you didn't drop in the bucket earlier. Just come get it prayed off you before you leave. If you want to get baptized, come up here. Let's get you water baptized today before you leave. Spiritually, you just need somebody to pray with you. Whatever you need. The band's just going to go back into praise and worship. Listen, if none of this is you, free to go. But if that's you, just come up here and spend some time with the Lord. Get prayed for, have some healing, get baptized, get born again, get saved. Hallelujah. Happy New Year. I speak the name of Jesus over you In your hurting, in your sorrow The last my God to move I speak the name cause it's all that I can do In desperation I seek heaven And breathe is for you I pray for your healing circumstances would change I pray that the fear inside would flee in Jesus name I pray that a breakthrough would happen today 